gospel of redemption, pay for the sinners of this world, pay the price that we could not pay, a debt that was so high that there was no way in which we could ever pay it off. And because of our wickedness, we did not even have any motivation or desire in our hearts to pay. But Christ in his love and his mercy came into this world and so mightily, even through his ministry, showed his great compassion for the lost. For those with hearts of stone, he came to give new hearts, living hearts. And Father, we pray that we might, as we enter into the study of this portion of scripture this morning, that we would see the Lamb, behold the Lamb of God, who has come to take away the sin of the world. Oh, Father, we pray for those that are going through afflictions and suffering, not only among our own brothers and sisters here, but throughout the world. We know, Lord, that in many places that there are still great battles with, with sickness and uh, with fears concerning COVID. We pray, oh, Lord, that in mercy and grace that you would uh, calm the fears of hearts as as even through these difficult times that you would use it for your glory to bring sinners to repentance, salvation, and also strengthen your church. Lord, through this past year and a half, we know that, that uh, there have been causes of division over issues that are, have been brought about because of different thoughts and different ideas and different informations concerning how to deal with, with the COVID situation, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you and that we would turn away from our own sinful desires and sinful ways and surrender to you and your leading, Lord, so that we do not in anything and in any way bring reproach upon the name of Christ. But Lord, that our lives and our words, our thoughts and our actions would all show that we are indeed a, a people redeemed from the world, redeemed through the blood of the Lamb, and that we would not seek no longer our own, knowing that we have died with Christ, we've been buried with him, and we've been raised with him. So that it's no longer I, it's no longer us, Lord, but it's Christ who lives in and through us. As we are being conformed into the image of Christ, may we truly be a light to the world to show that there is no other name given among men whereby they must be saved. And Father, in that we also pray that we would be a revived people. Revive us with your word this morning. May your spirit awaken us that we will hear what Jesus would have us to hear, that we would hear and be raised up to walk and follow our, our glorious Savior who came and said, follow me. Well, Father, we pray that there will be many disciples here and that we would then go out into the world as Jesus commanded, and preach the gospel and make disciples. And Father, we ask that those that are struggling with temptation, and maybe there are those that are struggling even with, with belief and have doubts, we pray that you give them a clear understanding, clear and peaceful wisdom in the Lord Jesus Christ to have confidence that he is working his will and accomplishing his purpose as he's building his church in the world and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. Well, use me, O Lord, for your glory here today to preach faithfully your word. We thank you and we praise you for this, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. It was the custom of Jesus to join himself with others on the Sabbath. So Jesus entered a synagogue, a place where Jews would meet on the Sabbath day for prayer and Bible reading and instruction. And we read in verse 1, he entered again into the synagogue, 
And there was a man there which had a withered hand. Often the use of the word hand is used in a symbolic way. Of course, this isn't symbolic in this, but we know that there are ways in which even today we use hand to represent power, abilities, uh, being taken by the hand of God. We refer to in, in the Old Testament such times as when by the hand of God, he caused the Red Sea to be divided. We read of where kings would hold out their hands as a gesture of mercy. Or a farmer, they would gather their crops with their hands. For the child of God, we have the wonderful assurance given to us that nothing can pluck us from our Father's hand. Now, having a withered hand here means that he had lost power. He had lost ability within that hand. It was a useless member of the rest of his body. Now, I don't want to offend those who are left-handed, but uh, Luke tells us in Luke's gospel that this man, the withered hand, was his right hand, and it was due to that that he was unable to do other things. And the reason I don't want to offend left-handed people is because they'll say, well, why didn't he use his left hand? Well, we don't know. He probably had to, but it would have caused him to have trouble opening jars or, or uh, doing just simple tasks, writing a letter, among other things. It was uh, the right hand that was uh, the one that was considered clean in that society, in that culture. It was considered the hand that you would eat with. And so it was a hand that was seen as important. Because of the times in which he lived, where there were no tools to help him and help to allow that hand to become useful again, to function, he may have lost a sense of accomplishment. He may have had a sense of even shame, not being able to work uh, it might have given him a sense or a loss of pride and accomplishments because with this, it would have deterred him from being fully able with the fullness of strength to provide well for himself and for his family in that society. The state of this man was not all that great because he would also be viewed by the Jewish community as a sinner. And they would point at his hand as being an example or proof of him being a sinner. For in many of them, their minds, their thoughts would have been, surely this man, either his parents or himself, that he had done something bad. He had done something sinful that would have brought upon him this infliction, and that it was a punishment from God. Another thing to think about as we begin this portion of Scripture is that this man was not what you would call a somebody. None of the other gospel writers mentions a name. He is a nameless, disabled man. That's all we know. Yet Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, he begins this, this story, this uh, same story, with the word behold concerning this man. And that's a very interesting thing because behold is often used in reference more to somebody of royalty or of some great proclamation, some high thought. Behold the Lamb of God was the cry of John the Baptist, highlighting the, the great and special person of Jesus and pointing the people's attention. Behold him. The prophet cried out, Behold, your king comes to you. That was the way in which the word behold would be used. Yet here, as it was in Matthew's gospel, behold a man with a withered hand. Behold a nameless man. Behold a man of no distinction, a man whose abilities are limited because his right hand has lost all its power, all its juice, its life. Behold a sinner. So what can we see here right away? We see God who has chosen the base things of the world. We see one who has chosen 
the foolish, the not so strong of the world. We find here a great demonstration of the compassion of God, the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he looks and he directs his attentions and his actions of mercy upon one who the rest of the world would simply overlook and say, your hands withered, you're unclean, you're under judgment of God. And this should be an encouragement to your heart this morning. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if your body is in great shape or is slowly failing you. Your hands may not be able to open a jar. Your feet may be slowing you down, losing the capacity maybe to walk from point A to point B. But look and see that God beholds you. God sees you. Our Lord looks upon you with mercy and compassion. In the world, when an event is held and all the media is present, who do they focus upon? They focus upon those who they think are great. They focus upon those who they think are worthy of being noticed. The rich, the powerful, those with fame and position in the world. Yet this morning, as we come together, God is not taken by those things. He's not moved by how much power one holds or how much money one has in their pocket or how much they have fame within the world. And so shouldn't we. So shouldn't we. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. James writes in chapter 2 of James, he writes, if there should come unto you an assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? How comforting so comforting to us are the words of the Lord Jesus who says in Luke 12, verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. How precious, how comforting that is to us who are born sinners. Now, this time, the Lord Jesus, here in Mark, he's not only watching this man, he's also noticing others who are watching him. That is, they're watching Jesus. In verse 2, it says, and they watched him, that is, they watched Jesus, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Now, verse 6 tells us who these men are. They are Pharisees. And here in verse 2, it says they're watching Jesus. And the purpose they're watching is they want to see whether he's going to heal this poor man. This man with his withered hand. And they're not watching him to see if he'll do it so that they can rejoice and say, well, well that's wonderful. Praise God that he's done this. They do so because they want to accuse him. Accuse him of breaking the law on the Sabbath day. Now this clearly shows the spirit of legalism. Legalism lacks mercy. Legalism lacks compassion. Legalism lacks love. It, it lacks thankfulness to God. Legalism is self-serving rather than based on the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Legalism rather seeks to condemn and it seeks to judge a person without a cause, without a true righteous cause. Legalism does not seek the good of a person. What legalism does <clears throat> is it seeks to keep them in their bondage. Legalism seeks to keep them in the bondage that they're under. The bondage of sin. And in this case, this poor man in the bondage of this withered hand. 
Later in time when Paul the Apostle was preaching the gospel and the Lord was building the church among the Gentiles, there were those who were called Judaizers. And these Judaizers were legalists who taught that the Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to enter in to the church. And this was causing great confusion, and it was a concern because it concerned what the gospel was, what salvation was, and where salvation is found. And so Paul, he wrote to the church in Galatia, which seemed to have been hit overly by these Ju Judaizers, these legalists, stating clearly this in Galatians 2, verse 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this occurred because a false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. See, Paul, he didn't mince words, because he did not call those legalists confused brothers. He didn't call them foolish brothers. He didn't even call them ignorant brothers. He called them false brothers. False brothers. He described them as being like the tempter himself. The one who comes in secretly, with stealth, not with the purpose to edify the believers, but to spy on them. What do they spy on? What are they, what are they looking for? They spy on the liberty of the Christian. The liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. And he, Paul says they do this to bring them into bondage. They don't want them in liberty. They want them in bondage. And that's always the way and purpose of legalism. Legalism's purpose is to take away the liberty we have in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and put us under a bondage. And so what does Paul add? He said that they did not yield submission even for an hour so that the truth of the gospel would continue with them. They would not listen to them even for a moment. Rather, they would submit to Christ alone and the freedom of the gospel, the freedom that is received through the gospel of Jesus Christ, freedom from sin, freedom from self-righteousness, freedom from the curse of the law, freedom of that bondage where one would put anything even on par with Christ as a means of being accepted by God. And it was the same freedom that the accusers of Jesus did not desire for themselves nor for anyone else, including this poor man with the withered hand. Now, it does not say that they said anything yet, that they said anything out loud in accusation, but Jesus knows their thoughts. <clears throat> he knows the sinfulness of their hearts. He knows the bondage that they're seeking to keep people under. And so Jesus tells the man to stand up. And then he directs his words on these legalistic, self-righteous men. In verse 4. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Now notice at this time the spirit and emotion that Jesus has to these legalists in verse 5. He has both anger and he has grief. Anger and grief. There is sinful anger and there is anger with sin. 
And there is also an anger with the sinner. God is angry, we're told in Scripture, with the wicked every day. In Psalm 2, it says concerning Jesus in verse 12, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. You know that the Bible never presents Jesus as being just kind of a mellow, uh, laid-back, easy-going, when it comes to sin kind of person. So just let it go. He is angry here, and he is grieved. He is grieved with, with those with the slowness of heart, with the lack of understanding, and with a rebellious heart against the gospel, against the truth. And this grief and this anger, it's, it's, it's not a careless anger. It's not a, a grief of saying, oh, I'm sad, but who cares as long as we just love each other, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. We must never neglect to, to give the full counsel of God's word as it pertains to the attributes and nature of God. We must never neglect to tell the sinner that God is a consuming fire. And that to deny Jesus as the Christ, as the Savior, to deny that he alone is the way, the truth, and the life, is sin itself. We must never neglect that. We're called to proclaim that. To claim that there are other means and other ways to God, or to even add to the cross of Christ with legalistic forms, with rules and regulations, it is to bring out God's wrath, his anger, to reveal the righteous anger of the Lord and the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. His compassion is on full display upon the man with the withered hand, but here, equal to that compassion is his anger with the wicked, with the unbelieving. So we have that balance of he is both one who has compassion and mercy. He is also one with righteous anger. In verse 3 it says, And he says unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. So Jesus, angry at those men, he takes this poor man and has him stand before the people and he uses him as an example and an argument against their wickedness. Their wicked hearts. He turns their thoughts to their own law that they are accusing him of breaking. What would your law allow? Good or evil? Murder or saving a life? Is doing good something that only applies six days of the week and becomes wrong on the seventh? Those who he gives this question to are, of course, the ones guilty of evil on the Sabbath. Because the intention of their heart is murderous. It's hateful. And to think that way, to have that in their heart, they've already committed murder. They've already committed sin. They want to destroy the life of Jesus. They also have uh, just a murderous, hateful heart toward this man with the withered hand. And so the question was not only to teach and give freedom to this poor man, but it's to... Also convict these false brethren. This is a deep and profound question that Jesus gives to them that we should seek to find an answer for. Because it actually brings up other questions. And we can ask this of ourselves. Do we only do good because the law tells us to do good? You know, there can be an act of righteousness that is done with a heart of unrighteousness. Do we only do it because God said it, and we just do it out of duty then? What and who determines what is good? Am I the one who decides? Are you the one that decides what is good? Or is it God? Why do good? Okay, here's an important question. Who can do good? Is good only based on action? Can someone do good, again, even if their heart and motive is bad? These are questions that we all must come to 
grips with in our lives as disciples of Christ. If we indeed are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, who from chapter 2 gave himself and declared himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. Now the answer to the question is, of course, rhetorical. It's never right to do evil, and it's never right to destroy or murder, and it is always right to do good and do it seven days a week. On another occasion with similar accusers, Jesus used their own actions to answer this question, and we find that in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> chapter 14, verse 1, says, And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. He took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. What Jesus was saying here was that every one of them, including the Pharisees who were accusing Jesus of doing wrong on the Sabbath by healing somebody, that these very same people, they would help their animals. He was showing their hypocrisy in that they were willing to labor on the Sabbath to help their animals because if they kept their animals in there, they're going to lose out themselves the rest of the week, yet they were unwilling to help their fellow man. What then was good or evil to do on the Sabbath? And so they couldn't answer Jesus. They couldn't convict Jesus of doing anything wrong. But because of their hatred for Jesus, it was... It was a blind hatred. They hated with him without a cause. It was so blind that when he did the good work of healing the man with the withered hand back in Mark, he writes in verse 6, the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. They hated him so much that when he did such an amazing, wonderful precious miracle of healing this poor man, their hearts were so full of just despite for the Lord. They just could not stand him and his teaching and the freedom of Christ that he brought, that they wanted him dead. They wanted to destroy him. They weren't thankful for the good the Lord did. They weren't thankful for the way the man was set free. So in their blind allegiance to themselves, in their own religious hypocrisy, their, their self-righteousness, their spiritual blindness, they could not recognize what was good, what was evil. They could not recognize the good Jesus did, nor the evil in their own hearts. In their darkness, they sought to get rid of him. What makes these accusers even more hypocr hypocritical was as it says in that verse 6 of, of Mark 3, that they took counsel with the Herodians against Jesus. The Herodians, self-righteous men making a pact with very unrighteous, in open display, man. What an hypocrisy. Their hatred for Jesus was so strong, they were willing to lay aside any sense of righteousness and godliness 
if they had any, and consort with a group who had no love for truth, who were breakers of the law of God. They were a political party. They were connected to the evil king, uh, King Herod. King Herod Antipas the, was the one that the Roman uh, Empire had set up over the land of Jews from 4 BC to uh, 39 AD. He ruled for Rome. He only put on a, an air of, of having any sort of love for the Jewish people, the building of temple and allowing them to worship God. This was only for political reasons. He didn't want riots. And for political expediency, the Herodians, and for self-righteous religious domination, the Pharisees, they came together, they unified against Jesus against the Lord of liberty and mercy. Uh, one of the things about the Herodians, it's believed that they, they looked to Herod as a, a form of a Messiah. They saw him as a savior of sorts and that he was going to, in some way, overthrow the Romans. And uh, so their whole idea was political. And so with Jesus coming as coming proclaiming to be the Messiah as one who is the savior of the world that was against their view of Herod and so this was a threat to the Herodians their desire was to lift up Herod to this powerful position in which the Romans had placed him and then they would be able then with the power to have more power and take over. The Lord Jesus, he regarded these two groups as a unity formed against him. That would also be something in which the church would have to look and be on guard of until he comes again. Not that there would be Pharisees and Herodians to this day, but the spirit of it. In which, in Mark 8, 15, he says, Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Yeast in that context is false teaching. Again, the false brethren, as it were. The rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. The hypocrisy of the legalists. And so in the presence of Jesus, these two groups, one for political purposes and one for religious purposes, were willing to put aside their differences and, and look for ways to kill Jesus. Again, their love for animals, or their love for their nation, their love for political power, their love for religious power, it trumps doing good, trumps doing what is right. It trumps mercy and compassion from the Lord. But then is the application that we can learn from these accounts that took place over 2,000 years ago. Well, Jesus is showing that a religious day does not trump doing good. Doing what is right and godly isn't trumped by that which we think is a, a righteousness of our own. Jesus is showing very clearly that as we found in the previous chapter, that he is Lord of the Sabbath, and whatever he does is good. And since Jesus is our rest, <clears throat> since Jesus is our Sabbath, our acts of doing good comes out of a heart that is indwelled by God who is good. There is none good but God. Jesus said that when a man came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good teacher. Jesus says, there's no one but good but God. And therefore, whatever good we are, whatever we do good, it first must come from God who came to save sinners. In this way, we see goodness is lived out as a life of sacrifice. Because Jesus, who is good, his whole life was a life of sacrifice. Sacrifice for us. And consider this man then with the withered hand. 
Withered has within it the meaning to be lifeless. It's, it's a lost hand, as it were. It has no life in it. And it, it could be considered a dead hand. Well, Jesus healed this man's hand. He gave new life to that man's hand. And he could now use his hand for good purposes. He could use that hand along with the other to make things work. He could use that hand along with the other to provide for his family. His hand, of course, did not receive life because of the Sabbath. But from Christ Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. And so it is with the sinner. The Bible, the scriptures, describes all sinners as being born into this world dead. Dead in sin. In that state of sin, with an evil heart, even the good we would do is found to be filthy. Corrupt. Even if it was done in the name of God, it was still corrupt. If it was done for religious reasons, all our good works are as filthy rags. It is then that Jesus enters. And he calls us to stand up. That is to rise up from the dead. And he not only heals our dead, withered heart, but he gives us a new heart. A living heart. He causes us to... Uh, to, to be raised from death to life. And this life doesn't come due to a day, a week, or a year. It does not come through the keeping of a, a law. This new life comes to us by the Spirit of God who quickens us, who says, rise up. He makes us alive. When he makes us alive... He also creates in us a clean heart. Remember that hand. It would be considered an unclean hand. When the Lord healed that hand, they would look upon it now as a clean hand. And so it is when the Lord gives us a new heart. He gives us a clean heart. And then with the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, like that withered hand made whole, we then are able and enabled to do good. Romans 3.12 reveals that before we were saved, not one of us did good. Not one thing we did was good. We were not good. But now the goodness comes only when we are in Christ, when he's raised us up and cleansed us, given us a clean heart before him. And then comes with it, it says in Ephesians 2, verse 10, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, there is now for us, for the Christian, a change of nature as well as a change of occupation. A change of nature and a change of occupation. We are in Christ called good now. Because we're in Christ who is good. And we're called by Christ now to do good. Some application for the good that we do include letting your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. It's through the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Our good works now include edifying one another. Exhorting one another in the body of Christ. It is to show compassion to the lost. Our good works include praying for one another, helping the weary, calling back the wayward, sharing the love and mercy of God, giving a cup of cold water to one of Christ's children, believing and knowing that even one cup is giving it to Christ himself. Micah 6, verse 8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Here's a few other portions of Scripture that teaches us what we are now in Christ, being good in him, now do good for him. 
Galatians 6 verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. Look for ways that God gives to you to do good to others. 1 Timothy 6 verse 18 says that they do good, that they are to be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Be rich in good works, which includes helping support those who God leads you to support in the ministries that he leads people into. Hebrews 13, 14, it says, or 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. The good works we do are, as it says there in Hebrews, are a sacrifice to God. They're offered up to the Lord. He receives them as an acceptable sacrifice to praise and worship. There are those who can go through religious motions. They can go through all the rituals that are within their church and even follow the ordinances that are given and yet lack the goodness of the Lord. Let us not lack the goodness of the Lord, for the Lord has called us and taught us to do so. 1 Peter 3.10 says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him stew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and sue it. When the company that was founded by Andrew Carnegie was taken over by the U.S. Steel Corporation in 1901, it acquired as one of its obligations this contract to pay Charles M. Schwab, who was then uh, who who had been also of that company, to give to him the unheard of minimum sum of one million dollars. J.P. Morgan of U.S. Steel, he was shocked. That was overwhelming to him, and he was in a quandary about it. How in the world are they going to pay that when? when the highest salary on record was at that time $100,000. And so he met with Schwab and he showed him the contract and he hesitantly asked what could be done about it. This, said Schwab, as he took the contract and tore it up. He said, I didn't care what salary they paid me, Schwab later told the Forbes magazine. I was not animated by money motives. Why do I work? I work for just the pleasure I find in work, the satisfaction there is in developing things and creating, also the associations business begets. The person who does not work for the love of work, but only for money, is not likely to make money nor to find much fun in life. Well, we can, of course, hear a bit of worldliness in his answer of that, but there are some truths there that are truly applicable to us as Christians. Consider the child of God. Why do you do good works? Why do you do good works? If it is simply to build yourself up and add to your self-righteousness, you are a legalist who will never find joy in serving Jesus. The motive's wrong. The motive is sinful. It's not good. If you are doing good works in order to be saved, that contract needs to be shredded. Because that's not going to save you. We do good because of the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ in us. Doing good is a fruit of that life given to us through the death of and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who came into this world, and everything he did every day of the week was good. It was for the glory of God. It was for the deliverance of those who were captive in sin. 
withered hearts, dead hearts, to give life and liberty through the gospel. To give life abundant and free, he says. Fellow Christian, will you do the good work of Christ for the motive he's given, and that is for his honor and glory, and for the love of Christ? Because of the compassion of the Lord upon you and upon me, he did good by going to the cross. It was a gloriously good work where he gave of himself as a sacrifice for our sin upon the cross. And therefore, will we do the good works of Christ with a life that is sacrificed for him? By being light and salt, that they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. Will you do good for the body of Christ by being faithful to the work of the ministry, using your God-given gifts to do good by edifying one another, encouraging one another, and even more so as the day of Christ's coming approaches? To do good unto all, especially those who are of the household of faith. I'd often say to my boys, look for ways to serve. We can change it a little with this today. Look for ways that God has chosen you to do good. Let's walk imitating the Lord of the Sabbath who always did good, but is due again. So more and more, as the day of Christ draws near, ask the Lord each day, what good will he have you do for a brother? What good will he have you do for a stranger? For the lost? For the saved, for a friend, for an enemy, most of all for Christ Jesus, who said to know to do good and to not do it, it is sin. As Jesus went about doing good, let us, by his spirit, let us do good. And may the Lord get all the glory. For our motives aren't to receive a salary but we receive so much better. We've received a good reward in heaven when we'll see our Savior, our good and glorious Savior, and we'll see him face to face. Amen.